And so we'll get started. I want to uh, welcome you to the Managing Online Tracking Technology Vendors, a checklist for compliance. Um, little note, we might have a different way to define online tracking technology vendors after we all got together. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, all right, so here's a little bit of an agenda. If these titles don't make sense to you, they will. There's uh, level setting, some market forces. We'll talk about managing your ad tech, putting it all together, looking ahead to 2024 and how Trust Dark and Baker Hostetler can help. So level setting. Uh, in the next couple slides, uh, we're gonna talk about ad tech vendors, which is the name that Taylor and Ryan and I kind of came up with the other day. Originally, this webinar was gonna be about tracking technology vendors, which you will see in the following slides might've been something that uh, the market might refer to the companies we're talking about as, but ad tech vendors might be the better name. So we're gonna get into that. We're gonna talk a little bit about tracking technologies. What are the ones that play? What are the ones that we should look for or not look for? What are the laws talking about? And personal information and scope. Uh, you might be surprised to learn about some of the things that might be considered personal information or the data points that are. And it's really important to keep track of them, uh, whether you're on the marketing team or the privacy team or anywhere else that's handling tracking technologies and personal information. So let's talk about this word ad tech vendors. Uh, what came to mind for me about over a year ago was in the Sephora decision, which was a, a, a retail company that was originally called out for not having their global privacy control um, effective and enabled when they should have been, um, was something else in the enforcement or decision that talked about Sephora not having adequate service provider contracts in place. And the service provider contracts related to uh, companies that had tracking technologies on the website. And so it immediately started me thinking that unlike a traditional vendor that you know you might collect personal information from, you might send it to them in a file, or you might be doing something offline. There's this idea of online vendors, which we all kind of assumed were just these, you know, pixels or companies that put these pixels in there. They're actually should be considered vendors. So you have an online vendor and an offline vendor. So the service provider contract really kind of sent a light bulb to me to look at things differently. And then a couple months later, uh, the OCR uh, released Controver a controversial bulletin, which I will not get into this, but it's being called out right now as um, uh, um, an overreach of their rulemaking authority um, in, in, in the HIPAA uh, breach notification rule, calling out vendors saying regulated entities are not permitted to use tracking technologies in a manner that would result in impermissible disclosures of PHI to tracking technology vendors. So here you see um, an actual statement calling these companies what they are is technology vendors. So that was last year. This year in August, I'm gonna turn it over to Taylor and let her talk a little bit about this uh, situation from the IAB's perspective. Yep, so this, this August of 2023, the IAB released its state privacy law survey results and it had some pretty notable highlights specifically around how where the respondents were thinking about vendor compliance and a lot of implications for tracking technology vendors. I think one of the big key takeaways was that most respondents truly believe that the term sale is a broad concept under each of these state privacy laws, and it generally captures making personal information available for sharing or targeted advertising, ad delivery, and measurement activities. Another big takeaway here was that uh, nearly half of the respondents still do not feel prepared to comply with vendor due diligence obligations that were that are required under the laws. Um, further, the majority of respondents uh, stated that after a user opts out, ads can be selected using publisher first party data or contextual signals only, um, which I agree with, um, but that there is still another significant percentage of the market that expressed um, what I would say is a pro, uh, problematic belief that ad selection based on advertiser personal information can be leveraged, um, which I think is a big disconnect there. Um, lastly, you know, ad agencies can have liability if they fail to conduct adequate diligence on privacy compliance requirements and effectuating ad campaigns. Yeah, that's a, it was a really um, important survey. 
that has come out. So if you haven't read it or haven't looked at it, feel free to, or want some guidance, feel free to talk to Taylor or, about it. Um, but it is available to, to look at. And I, and I think that um, the awareness around uh, the need to get in compliance um, around some of these areas and how much of the industry doesn't feel like they're there yet um, is really important. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so Taylor uh, and I were talking about personal information and its definition. Um, we chose CCP CCPA, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Taylor to talk a little bit about this definition of personal information. We just wanted to highlight that the definition of personal information is super broad. Uh, the CCPA's definition is a good baseline to look at because it's the most broadly worded. I would say that the other state privacy laws um, encompass all of this. It's just not specifically called out in the definition. But I, I do recommend reading this closely and recognizing and understanding that, you know, a unique personal identifier, an online identifier, an IP address, all of that implicates personal information. So unique identifiers include things like cookies, pixel tags, MAIDs, um, and other similar technologies. So definitely really important to read this, be familiar with it, understand it. Um, some other definitions to think about and be familiar with are from what, what is precise geolocation under the law, um, because it does differ a little across the various state laws. And then also in this ad tech e ecosystem, understanding where um, internet or other electronic network activity information comes in, that all of these items as well are all considered personal information. So your browsing history, your search history, anything regarding your interactions with the website or ad, that all comes into play here as well. So something to be really, really aware of and familiar with is understanding truly how broad this concept is and why this matters. It, it really does. And what in my experience, um, if you are either in the privacy office or in the marketing office, there's, there's accountability on both uh, sides right now to say, hey, I should flag this if I am collecting this or if I'm aware of this, I need to let the privacy office know or bring this to my outside counsel. And if you're the privacy office, you need to be looking at, hey, what are, can you please check a box and tell me, do you have any of these things? Are you looking at any of these, anything, any of these uh, items? Not just your email address or your name, but you can see how granular California has gotten. And mm -hmm. as Taylor said, it really is a baseline and we can start seeing some other jurisdictions wanting to get uh, a, a little more specific with their updates to their laws, especially in the EU with things like unique identifiers. All right, so this is a great fun slide. I'm gonna turn this over to Ryan and, and Taylor to talk about myths uh, and truths about what the technologies are, what they do, and which ones really are ones to kind of be more concerned about because some of the laws do are starting to call out these specific technologies um, in particular uh, on this slide. Taylor or Ryan, I, which one? Feel free to start. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I could start. Um, yeah, so it, it's just a good call out because we're all so familiar with cookies, but there are other means of, of tracking users. Um, you'll see at the top, we have pixels and, and web beacons. So outside of cookies, there are other mechanisms where users are identified on the web. So it might be based on some sort of cache object on the browser that is identifying the user and then uh, uh, maybe not as a known person, but identifying them in such a way that tracking is possible and collection of personal data is possible using the underlying technologies on the website. And um, also in, in this day and age, first party cookies are becoming more common. So that might be something you're seeing with your, your ad tech vendors as well as a, as a move towards first party cookies. And it, it, you know, it might be uh, thought of as, you know, those are not a concern, but if they're used to collect personal information or the underlying technologies used to collect personal information, then that's something that it may be in scope for you. What about SDKs or Taylor, want to hit any of those? Oh, I was just going to explain what a pixel actually is. You know, oh. um, it's it just, you know, it's it's tiny invisible images that are placed on web pages. Usually in the footer, they gather image, they gather info around um, website visitors and track activity on the site. Just wanted to kind of throw that in there, what the actual technology is doing. 
because those have been pretty hot in um, some litigation recently, calling out the the Metapixel. Um, so Taylor just gave a good description about that. Um, we were talking uh, amongst us the other day about SDKs and third party libraries, and I know those were called out. And Ryan, I know you've you and I have talked about session replay tech a little bit. Um, any interest in talking a little bit about these or things to be aware of? Yeah, I think with the session replay tech, that's that's becoming more and more common so that uh, user sessions are being tracked. Um, there's so many different tools out there. Um, Heap is a good example. So um, uh, I think that's something that is uh, being brought up more with regulators, right, Andrew? Definitely. And I think Taylor can speak to that. And how does session replay tech work, Ryan? Yeah, so <clears throat> there is an identifier. So say, for example, a cookie that would sit on the user's browser. And um, as the user traverses through the website, a lot of data can be collected. Essentially, their mouse movements, their keyboard clicks um, as they go from one link to the next, as they click on different buttons. A lot of that, a lot of the time that information is collected to measure performance or adoption of features, but sometimes that's also used for profiling users, um, collecting information for marketing or sales purposes. A lot of times this is used generally to see how a user is using your website. So you're trying to see where yep. you, where friction occurs. So where does the user yep. stop? Where, where did they, you know, it took too long on this page and they left the website. A lot of it is used to see you know, what do you need to improve? How's a user interacting on your site? Where are they going page to page? How is that working? But what that in effect does is tracks how they're using a site to have, if they're completing a form, what they're doing. Um, and we've seen a variety of litigation regarding the use of these and trying to equate them to, uh, you know, various wiretapping laws. But in, in reality, a lot of this can be innocuous. It just depends on how it's being used. So it's really important to understand what you're using, how it's being used, what it's capturing, uh, making sure you're not using them on pages where sensitive data may be being inputted. Um, there's various ways it can be used, but you need to be careful of what, the, what it's actually capturing and what's getting sent to that third party. That's yeah. a great summary. Anything else to re uh, add to this before I move on? Ryan or Taylor, you want to hit? Yeah, just <clears throat> just to mention SDKs briefly, or AKA software development kits. They're usually um, kits that are added to mobile applications. With mobile applications, they don't always have cookies. So often they will track using some sort of device identifier. So for Android or iPhone, iOS, um, there might be an identifier on that user. And that user is then uh, tracked using that identifier. It could even be some sort of geolocation or IP address that's being used to 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 track the user and collect information about them. Okay, sounds good. Taylor, anything else? No, I think about there a lot okay. of that. All right, we're going to move on to this topic called market forces. And so, as what I what I've noticed uh, with both clients coming to Trust Arc and just ourselves is that. Um, there are a lot of different um, forces that I call them that are causing companies to reform and um, that are influencing their uh, compliance processes. So California is kind of like what I call a force. Other states have their own kind of call outs and carve outs. Uh, the health sector, if you are collecting, if, if health privacy is something that um, might be in scope for your organization, litigation as Ryan talked about and Taylor uh, session replay tech is causing different people to um, different organizations to change. And you know, the idea that potentially you could be California compliant and still be subject to litigation could further uh, change your privacy practices and then the EU. So uh, on all fronts. So we kind of briefly want to talk about some of the, the major key market forces, as I call them, that are influencing and informing privacy practices within organizations and uh within uh, at firms. So the first one is probably, there's a lot to talk about in California, but I really wanna talk about with respect to tracking technology is, Cal is, is the Sephora case. Um, in August, 2022, as we stated earlier, there was an enforcement uh, decision uh, between Sephora and the California AG. No guilt was found on part of uh, Sephora at all. It's just a, a, a new, I, I guess, piece of, uh, 
legal literature that we all get to uh, look at. Um, there's a new definition that was written into that, which I think is really, really, really important. Um, it's called sale using online tracking technology. So this is a new definition. It's not in the CC CCPA, but it should be um, in the forefront of organizations and firms' minds when they are dealing with tracking technologies and personal information. So in this definition, as you can read, I've kind of parsed it out into three different elements. I think you could probably make four or five out of it, but to try to keep it simple, but you know, highlighting that they actually do call out technologies like pixels, web beacons, software development kits, third-party libraries and cookies and such as. So I think that's open to other technologies coming within scope. So I think this is important to, to know, as I said earlier, to you know understand uh, whether you are conducting a sale and share because that will trigger certain obligations that you will have to um, undergo. So knowing that this is the case, um, what do you do if you're a privacy office or if you're marketing? What should you be aware of when you're trying to onboard or evaluate the current uh, tracking tech that you have or the advertising technology vendors you have and you're subject to CCPA? So this is not meant, this is nothing official, but this is meant to provide a little, I don't know, brief um, checklist that you can maybe ask yourself, you know, first, obviously, you know, is our are you subject to the CCPA? Um, do you meet the threshold? Are you collecting uh, personal information of consumers uh, as defined in California? And then check, okay, if it's a yes, you go to number two. Does your organization use online tracking technologies? All the ones that Taylor and Ryan just talked about and perhaps then some, if you're using those, check, let's go to number three. Now let's, kind of deep dive a little bit into whether you are either disclosing the personal information on your websites to third parties, or you are, as California is looking at, making it available, which is basically um, allowing a third party to come access the personal information from your website. I kind of look at kind of look at it like a Blackberry patch or Blueberry patch. Is it available to anyone to come take the Blackberries? Or are you, uh, the only way the Blackberries leave are, are you actually disclosing them? So, Perhaps that's a bad uh, way to look at it, but that's kind of how I see what making available looks like. So if that's happening, then you have to go into, is there a benefit? So if there's a monetary benefit, uh, Sephora talks about this, um, both in the complaint and in the enforcement decision, this is how I've interpreted it. Um, is there a actual tangible, a traditional currency being exchanged for the, the personal information that's being made available or disclosed? Or is there, you know, one of those free services that have um, that you sign up and, you know, information is exchanged for something else without actual money going exchanging. And so tangible you know, traditional currency. So um, this is kind of what is hooking most of the market is the idea that we're not paying for the personal information. Um, we're actually there's some some type of free or discounted services that's happening like analytics. And so putting analytics and scope specifically in the Sephora decision or enforcement action has really uh, alerted the market to an analysis that needs to be done. If that's happening, go to go to number five. There are there is perhaps an exception. Um, it's a really important to check out um, the requirements for service provider contracts uh, that Sephora didn't have in place um, right now in the regulations. You can probably find those in section seven zero five zero at SEC. Um, specifically 70501 for service providers. If you have all those uh, requirements in place in your contract with your ad tech vendor, uh, there might be an exception uh, here. So definitely talk to your outside counsel like someone like Taylor. And then after you're done with this analysis, you'll need to classify this ad tech vendor. So is it a service provider or a third party? That's the California classification. And then if it's a third party, you must provide an opt out. So, you know, Ryan will talk a little bit later after you classify your vendors as service provider third party, how do you categorize it uh, when it comes to tracking technologies on your website? That's a different conversation, but you can see there is a rigorous process. And I think documenting something, uh, showing a good, a good faith effort in how you are approaching your ad tech vendors, all of them. <laughs> and I know some, of, some people out there have a lot of different vendors on their, their website or they're using. Uh, is really good in case uh, you ever have to 
um, in case you're ever called called out about it. So I'm going to keep it moving to the next slide and I think hand it over to Taylor. Yep. So one thing we wanted to make sure to call out is all of these laws provide very similar rights. Um, there's some slight differentiations, but in the ag tech ecosystem, it's important to understand what we're thinking about here. So obviously we have the amended CCPA, which provides um, the new right to opt out of sharing for cross-context behavioral advertising, which came into effect on January 1st of this year. Uh, then we have the Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act, the VCDPA, which also provides consumers the right to target, right to opt out of target advertising and also came into effect on January. Um, next up, we have the Colorado Privacy Act, which also provides the right to opt out of target advertising, but didn't come into effect until July. Then we have Connecticut, which provides the same right and also was July. But lastly, we have Utah, which has not came into effect yet and provides consumers the right to opt off targeted advertising, but it comes into effect um, end of this year. So very, very soon. Um, it's important to note that all five of these laws give consumers the right to exercise controls around behavioral or what we call targeted digital advertising, but it does they do preserve the ability for business to engage in contextual advertising. Um, and when we say behavioral or targeted advertising, we're talking about tracking a consumer's activities online, including things like searches that consumers conducted, web pages they visited, content they view. And this is done in order to deliver targeted advertising to the consumer's individual interest. Um, this is you know, also sometimes called interest-based advertising. Um, so targeted advertising allows advertisers and publishers to target uh, customers based on their behaviors across different websites. So if, for example, if someone, uh, you know, browses Amazon for a new knife without making a purchase, Amazon's advertising um, network allows them to be targeted on another site for those same knives. Um, you know, and then when we talk about contextual advertising, we're talking about, you know, actually placing ads on pages based on the contents of those pages. So, for example, this means an ad served based on the context of what the, the website viewer is actually on. So, uh, you know, placing an ad for running shoes on a running forum is an example of contextual targeting. Everybody loves the running shoes example. It's pretty easy. It's, easy. it's pretty, it's the running shoes running is like, it's the forum, thing. But if you're on a running <laughs> forum, you might see an ad for running shoes. Sam. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, running shoes aren't like the most divisive topic, so it's like an That's, easy. Yeah, it's, it's, an, easy, it's an easy one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep it moving. Uh, another market force is health privacy. Um, a lot of the FTC, and I think that's really we're going to try to touch on it, but not go as, as deep to it. The FTC has been very active, um, expanding the definition of what uh, consume uh, what you know PHI might be by bringing it out to consumer you know, health data, um, very important. And they are taking a similar approach into looking at tracking technologies and what is an impermissible uh, disclosure or collection of them. Um, not identical to California, but in the spirit, there's, there's a very similar spirit to what's going on with tracking technologies and health data. So I think, you know, pay attention to uh, whether your company is creating or is, is creating inferences and how they're using it because some of the the more innocuous personal information that you know used to be just PI might actually be considered in a new scope uh, health information. And I think um, we're going to see that um, uh, on steroids. I think with the Washington's My Health My Data Act, and I'm going to pass it over to Taylor on that. So while state privacy laws truly multiplied in 2023, I think the most important one that many people are overlooking is Washington's My Health, My Data Act. It is so much broader than what people think. So this act came about as a means to close the gap on the data that consumers mistakenly think is covered by HIPAA, but isn't. So consumer health data is super broadly defined and includes includes any data that reveals a health condition or diagnosis, but also non-health related data if it's used to infer a health condition or diagnosis. So um, a few things to note, the My Health, My Data Act applies to any companies that collect, use, disclose, or sell consumer health data of Washington consumers. So notably, the usual revenue or consumer thresholds do not apply. So a business who might have been subject to CCPA because they hit the revenue threshold or might have been subject to one of the other state privacy laws if they hit the consumer threshold, none of that matters for this law. 
you process one consumer's health data, you're in scope. So um, I think the most important thing for companies to be doing is analyze whether you're processing consumer health data um, from Washington consumers. So I'd say your goal is to identify each distinct data set that includes consumer health data. Yeah, and that word processing is is pretty broad too, you mm -hmm. know, in the understanding that it's not just you you processing, but if you are using a vendor that might exist in Washington, which there are some large ones uh, that live there, brings you in scope too. So that territorial reach could be global, maybe. We will see how uh, what happens with this private right of action. I think that's going to be the the key factor here. Totally. Okay. And then litigation. So we talked about it earlier. Litigation is a market force that is uh, speeding up. Um, we're seeing increasing uh, lawsuits coming out that are kind of using untraditional laws, as we've listed below, wiretapping, the VPPA, um, the, you know, RICO conspiracies, uh, allegations are, are coming, are coming forward. And they are looking at tracking technologies and a lot of session replay tech, um, thinking think more about an eavesdropping or think about what, uh, you know, actively concealing is, is, the, is the kind of words of art that I'm seeing um, for personal information and the consent practices not being, uh, I guess, measuring up to the standard. And some, some of these laws are kind of frivolous. And I think, Taylor, you can speak to that. You probably have a lot more insight in your practice and what you're seeing. Yeah, I think it's just, it's important to understand that there's significant increasing risk for using a lot of these different technologies. And while some of these claims may be baseless, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have to spend the money to defend your defend yourself. So it's really important to understand what you're using, how you're using it, um, understand what pixels are on your site, what session replay technologies you're using, and are they truly business critical? Um, I think a really important factor to think about is, is this technology we're using, is it really worth it to us? Or is it just like, hey, maybe it's nice to have, we don't really get much value from it. If you don't get much value from it and you're not really leveraging it, probably want to decrease your risk and remove it. If it's something, I have lots of clients say, hey, you know, that that technology is so business critical to us, we will totally take on the risk of any potential litigation. Great. But you need to have that, you know, that risk balancing discussion um, up front with your, your outside counsel and have those discussions and talk it through and understand where your business teams are coming from. How much revenue is coming through from that? What's your conversion rate? Is it really worth it? And if it is, great. But you need to have that discussion and think through those considerations. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, I'm going to keep it moving to the EU and the UK. Um, I just want to bring that for the, the EU and in, into the picture because um, the definition, while it doesn't necessarily in the GDPR, the UK GDPR doesn't especially call out um, cookies or tracking technologies, some of their accompanying uh, directives or the PCR, they do. And I think that the GDPR is looking to expand uh, the definition of uh, what they consider to be tracking technologies. Uh, they sent out, they issued uh, some recent guidelines around that asking for comment just about a week and a half ago. And I think there is a focus uh, right now for enforcement. It may not be so much on the tracking technologies as in um, the cookie banners and what kind of consent practices companies are providing. So we've seen um, several DPAs, Belgium, France, Spain, issue these cookie consent guidance documents uh, they're harmonizing. It seems to be more similar between each of the um, countries. And I think we can expect more DPAs to issue these guidance documents. There is a cookie banner task force that released a, issued a report last January talking about um, um, suggested practices on cookie walls, dark patterns. And so there's a focus over there right now on how those, you know, the cookies are working as well. So um, I think the EU to UK is kind of I don't know if catching up is the right word they're doing their their thing, but it it it's something to be aware of that they are also starting to consider what these technologies are and um, being more specific about the personal information they're looking for. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Ryan as he's going to talk about managing your ad tech. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so. I think the first step with tracking technologies is to understand that they're used to identify users, but uh, 
the second step is also to understand that there are underlying third-party technologies potentially sitting on your websites or your mobile apps that are collecting PI on those users using those identifiers. And how do trackers uh, exist on a customer's on a consumer's browser? They're they're basically coming from the third party code that sits on the websites or third party SDKs that sit on the consumer uh, applications. So how how can you manage that code to prevent that collection of personal information? And um, uh, one way of doing that is using a tag management system. So you have your consent management provider that will provide a notice and, and choice mechanism. But uh, as a CMP, we don't control your websites. Um, uh, you guys would control your own websites. And so uh, a tag management system is often a central location for third-party tags, for example, to be controlled. Um, this is a very common uh, method to manage all the different third-party code that sits on a website. And the way that we integrate with that is we will send events to a tag management system to let the tag manager know, hey, the user has opted in or opted out of, say, advertising technologies or analytics technologies. Um, and so um, that that uh, compliance happens when both of those solutions are operating together and um, and the user's choices are respected. So we can go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, the first, first place to really begin is to scan your website. So you can see here an example of our consent manager where you can add a website and you can conduct scanning. And then the next step, if you go to the next slide, is to do some discovery. So um, for TrustArc, what we're doing, and uh, Andrew, I don't know why the image isn't showing there. Okay. <laughs> it went away. It, it went on. away. Um, so anyway, it's okay. Um, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> basically we had an image there where you could see a list of different categories. So we have required and functional. Um, so uh, basically, uh, those categories have within themselves um, the different cookie trackers and other technologies. And for TrustArc, what we'll try to do is we'll automatically try to categorize based on a vendor uh, what we see that particular tracker coming from. Is it analytics related? Is it uh, functional or ad tech related? So we'll try to uh, categorize those trackers. So. That's an important piece, I think, for a CMP is to um, to attempt to uh, figure out well where does that tracker sit. I think on the customers end or or on the publishers end, it's important to make sure that that's correct to validate it and work with your your counsel to make sure everything looks good. If you go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, yeah, uh, once, once you... one second. Can I can I yep. chime in there because I think that's a really important. Uh, part for Taylor too. I'm sorry not to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. Taylor, but you know, when we do discover the, you know, when you, when we when a when an organization says, okay, this is a we we think this is a uh functional uh tracker or an advertising tracker, you know, because of all the, you know, different requirements and the jurisdictions and how to categorize them, talking to someone like Taylor is so important and making sure they they have that. Do you notice that experience with you, Taylor, and how you help your clients in understanding that? I think it's really important to make sure you understand the, the legal requirements here. So yeah. in the EU, you you do need to provide that additional level of granularity and explain, you know, there's functional cookies, there's analytics, there's performance, um, and allow people, you know, the granular option to opt out. In the US, that's not a real concept. What you have to do is allow people to opt out of cookies that are considered a sale or share. Um, and so depending on where you operate and how you operate, if you have a, you know, global operations, you might want to take a big, broad approach. Um, but if you're just subject to California and the U.S. state privacy laws, you might want to take a more nuanced approach and allow opt outs of tracking technologies that constitute a sale or share. But you don't need to necessarily say opt out of functional, opt out of analytics, opt out of performance, opt out of advertising. Uh, it totally depends on what you're subject to. 
Um, and so some of these like one, one size fits all approaches, it, it might not be the best approach for your company based on how you operate, what your needs are. Um, there's some really cool, unique approaches that I have clients taking that we've worked through, but you have to actually have that discussion and go through that analysis to see the best way to go about that. Um, and you know, that functional cookie might be a complete service provider and you don't need to provide an opt out. And so you might be going above and beyond by allowing them to opt out there. And then that's hurting your performance. So um, there's a lot of considerations to take into account here. It's not that black and white. That's a really great insight that that risk-based approach that you were talking about early, earlier, so important. So go to Taylor. You don't want to hate you. You got to think about what's the risk here and what's the business benefit. Totally. I think that, uh, That makes sense. And I, I think also that depending on where your consumers are located, you can control that level of granularity in your tag manager. So if your users are located in the EU, you might want to take uh, an approach where those technologies are opted out of automatically. And then only when the user opts in, in their choice mechanism, does uh, do those technologies function on the user's browser and those trackers engage Um, And as Taylor mentioned with CCPA, for example, in California, you may not want to opt out immediately. You may want to just opt out of the ad tech related vendors when the user attempts to opt out. Um, So if you go to the next slide, Andrew, this is an example more of GDPR. So you do have the breakdown of the categories here on the left, and then you have a, a cookie banner on the top right. The managed settings will open up the, the, the modal on the left-hand side. And then at the bottom, we have more details about the individual trackers, which um, you can uh, view from the consent manager or from a embedded iframe, say, in your cookie policy. So this is an example where you can get more information about um, the different vendors or ad tech vendors, the individual categories, and the tracking technologies. For CCPA, it can be simplified. So for example, you can have just a simple banner if you want. Uh, You may not even want a banner. You might just want to use the GPC approach where there's a global signal that occurs if the user has enabled that in their browser, and it'll automatically opt out of the ad tech vendors, or you could control it through your DSAR form. That's another method of handling it through like a, a do not sell or share link in your footer. So um, based on geolocation, we can support in different, uh, the different mechanisms based on where the user is coming from and what um, legislation applies to their jurisdiction. And this, uh, this iframe on the bottom right is becoming more and more, I think, trending with uh, wanting to meet the needs in the EU, at least of providing cookie purposes or information to explain uh, the cookies or the trackers. So this, I think, is something that's becoming more and more uh, important to make sure you have that ability to share information about the trackers on your site and before the user actually enters the site. Yep. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, we've noticed uh, with a lot of clients that we work with that the tag managers are are challenging to implement and and have up-to-date and configured um, this is an area that TrustArc has helped out with a lot. Um, we see three tag managers that are often used as Google Tag Manager, Adobe um, Platform Experience Launch, and Telium. And um, you'll see an example there of a functional and an advertising tag that has been configured in the tag manager. So um, controlling which code fires based on the user's consent choice in the consent manager uh, is very important because if you don't have it configured right, say for example, um, in the GDPR region, uh, then you could be um, allowing uh, capabilities on your website to to continue to operate and collect PI even even though the user hasn't opted in yet, or potentially they've opted out of the consent management solution and those um, technologies continue to function and collect data. An example also with say CCPA, a user may have opted out of ad tech related vendors and um, you may still have those ad tech related vendors functioning and um, uh, collecting for sale or share. 
And um, that's something that I think is becoming more and more important uh, to evaluate. Um, we've seen examples of uh, class action lawsuits um, and uh, we've seen much more concern by customers in this regard uh, where they're asking us for help with how do we manage our tag managers? And some customers are coming to us and saying, we don't have a tag manager. We have all our third party code sitting directly on our website. And what do we do? So you can go to the next slide, Andrew. So there are some, some other options than a tag manager. So with TrustArc, we have developed a, a tag blocking solution. Think of a tag as a piece of uh, code that allows something to, to function on your site. It might be like a, a Facebook like button or some kind of um, Google double click code or, or something else. And so um, we do have some code that will attempt to uh, block those requests uh, directly on your website. So that's a solution that um, some of our clients have, have used uh, either in parallel with a tag manager or just on its own. Uh, and some of our customers have um, created some code directly on their site to do an API calls to find out what did the consumer opt out of and then block code based on the consent choice of the user. Um, the final piece to this, I think that's really crucial. If you go to the next slide, Andrew, is, is auditing. So you may have set up a consent manager uh, on your website and um, you know, you have users different visiting from different regions. And how do you know if um, the tag manager is operating properly and that uh, tracking technologies are not executing on the browser? Um, we talked previously before how you have other trackers besides cookies. There's beacons, there's e-tags, there's HTML5 objects, the different methods for tracking users beyond cookies. And so this is an example of an of an of an a scan or a crawl that we can do and create an audit of uh, different scenarios. So one scenario might be uh, we have our server in the EU do a scan of the website and uh, we can see did any technologies drop cookies prior to the user opting in. So that would be potentially a, a violation of GDPR. And then another type of audit that we might do is um, uh, our tracker still dropping even though the users opted out. So our scan will attempt to um, emulate a user that's opted out and then start visiting different pages on your website to see, hey, are there any other third party technologies dropping? And then a, a last example I'll give is with CCPA. You may have GPC in place, or you might have some sort of opt out using uh, a do not sell link in a footer or a banner. And let's say the consumer's in California and they've opted out. Well, at that point, do you still have technologies that could potentially be used as a sailor share? So you might have ad tech running, maybe Google double click, and you've got uh, monetization using ads. Uh, then at that point, I think that's the kind of um, report you'd want to see is, oh, okay, are we actually, in fact, opting, respecting that opt out by the user? So um, uh, that pretty much sums up kind of the, the ad tech uh, uh, side of it that I wanted to cover, Andrew. Thank you. That sounds great. Thanks a lot, um, Ryan. Taylor, anything to add at the moment? No, I think that was great. That was really helpful, Ryan, to kind of see that behind the scenes look. All right, I'm going to keep it moving. We're doing good on time. Uh, putting it all together. So this is the slide that we're going to discuss. We talked earlier about the laws and Ryan did a great audit kind of big picture. And so this is something that um, we were talking about a little bit. And so here's a potential flow if you're onboarding a new ad tech vendor, a new tracker is coming on. You want this analytics because it's really important to marketing. Uh, what is an, a potential process look like? This is not meant to be the end all be all the perfect process, but we were just, it's, it's a brainstorm. Someone on marketing submits a vendor request assessment, ideally. And there's a, an assessment filled out. There's questions. They say who it is, who's the contact at this third party. Uh, what are the technologies that we think are using and what type of PI is being collected? We think 
And so if it gets approved, then potentially there's going to be a due diligence um, around with outside counsel, you know, in-house looking uh, under the hood, kind of a deeper dive at this company and the, this organization you want to onboard, you know, their risk posture, what's their history, what are they doing, uh, what are their relationships like with their service providers and how they're using the data. And so obviously after that is done and the due diligence gets the check, uh, there's a negotiation in the agreement to get the, 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 the applicable laws terms in there. And, you know, sometimes these things happen out of order. Sometimes this never happens, but this is so important to have for in case there isn't ever an audit done or necessary to happen. Um, so, of course, record these things. And then I'm going to let, uh, you know, uh, I guess, Ryan, you want to talk about uh, implementing the technology and configuring it like you just did? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that you're looking to want to have some type of CMP solution, um, you're definitely going to want to make sure that it's configured based on where you're targeting users, where they're coming from, and what type of laws are in place with that. Often that's a that's something to have a communication with, um, with like outside counsel like Taylor, or with your inside counsel, or um, and, and it's often a communication that happens across marketing, uh, across IT, across legal, um, and then once you have the uh, CMP in, in play, then you're going to want to make sure it's um, configured properly and make sure that um, you have a tag manager in place. So um, you might have a new piece of ad tech that you're adding to your site. I think um, at that point, it's useful to understand more about it. Um, do you have uh, a service provider contract in place or is it a third party? How do you want to make it visible in your consent management solution? Um, and how is it configured in the back end? Okay. So we've, we've done the scans, we've implemented, and then Taylor, uh, we were talking about, poor words, I guess, uh, <laughs> instead of tailoring, cater catering, catering your, your scanning cadence and uh, your notice uh, practices to reflect the new technology you've yeah. So, yeah, obviously you want to make sure everything's working. Um, there's countless times where a client says, don't worry, we got it up and working. And then it goes live and then we test it and the opt-out doesn't actually work. Um, that, that it's really important to actually test these things. Um, test in different browsers, different environments. Um, you might get different experiences, super important to do. Um, and then, yes, your notice practices need to reflect the technology on the site. Um especially certain types of disclosures that can mitigate risk, like having very adequate disclosures around the types of session replay technology you're using and how that works and what it constitutes. Uh, but in general, you know, you want to be accurate in your website disclosures and your privacy notices. Um, we definitely know the CCPA and the regs have very prescriptive requirements around the types of disclosures that are required, um, but also being transparent and clear to your consumers. Uh, super important. And then lastly, yes, a cadence for scanning. So, you know, if you're super sophisticated and you have a very well-documented process for onboarding new vendors and you are super confident that nothing is going on there without that process running, you maybe only need to scan quarterly. Um, that's not the case for everyone. And so, you know, that might require that you scan monthly. Um, I, I think it, until you get into a good place and you have a really strong, you know, due diligence process in place where you're sure that, you know, that your marketing team isn't, um, you know, running loose and bringing on new new technology that hasn't been vetted and isn't integrated with your opt out, you, you might need you need to cater your cadence for scanning um, to what how your internal operations actually work. So there's no one size fits all for everyone. Um, definitely recommend at least quarterly, maybe maybe closer. Um, if you never put anything on your site and you're never doing anything new and you use like two or three vendors and there's never been anything else, hey, maybe you could go every two quarters. Pretty rare, but hey, I, it could happen. That's so good. This is a this is like a like you said, not it's not a one size fits all, and you know. Okay. Talking to outside counsel like Taylor is so helpful in trying to really analyze that um, and and have, you know, a, a third party, you know, like Taylor or outside counsel help vet the practices that you have in place right now. 
and um, really, you know, hold, you know, the organization more accountable internally to their, um, their processes, which is good. All right, looking ahead to 2024. Quickly, uh, Ryan, do you want to, in like 30 seconds to a minute, talk about <laughs> what it could be if there's deprecation of cookies? I know people are talking about that in Q3. Yeah, it's it's definitely coming up more and more. So Google um, has decided, if you if you guys aren't aware, that with Chrome, there uh, is a plan to deprecate third party cookies and move towards what what Google's calling a privacy sandbox. Um, that's been, I think, um, delayed maybe four or five times. So it's a little bit unclear when the plan is to do that. Right now, I understand it's likely Q3 or Q4 of next year. So as that progresses, um, uh, the uh, future of how ad tech tracks users is, is likely going to change. I think there's going to be much more of a direction towards first party uh, cookies. Um, I think that uh, there might be some other solutions out there uh, like UID2 where they're doing it based on uh, a user identifier of the user. Um, and then there's also um, other tracking technologies that exist that we talked about previously. So if you if you have a CMP solution that's only looking at cookies, you may want to go beyond that and look at, well, what about other tracking technologies like beacons and uh, e-tags and things of that nature? Because those do exist and um, it's necessary to start looking at that um, as you approach the new year. All right, so I'll take really quickly in the EU, I think it's going, they're going to look at expanding the scope of personal information and tracking technologies. We talked about that earlier. I believe the more data protection authorities will continue to create uh, cookie guidance and harmonize with each other um, and, and up their cookie uh, enforcement. And I have no reason to believe that F FTC will not continue to um, enforce uh, you know, tracking technologies in the health space, uh, in the financial sector, potentially, as we saw with the H&R Block case, and, and who knows what else uh, is up their sleeve. Taylor, do you want to hit five through seven? Yeah, so I think what's really important to know is that the CPPA is really going to be focusing on what's going on behind the scenes. They're hiring technologists, they're developing their own technology solutions for scanning. Um, they've gotten proficient at checking mobile apps and SDK opt-outs. Um, and ensuring those are actually functioning um, and that data flows are shut off. Um, they're really getting more behind the scenes. So it is really important to have it buttoned up. Um, they just, they're just going to continue to get more sophisticated. Uh, so really important to note that. Um, also, as I mentioned before, My Health, My Data Act will go into effect. Um, there's two effective dates, one for larger entities, one for smaller entities. Regardless, they're going to be in effect in 2024 for everyone by mid-year. And that private right of action um, can be a pretty motivating factor to get that piece figured out. And lastly, we don't think litigation is going to stop. We're going to continue to see litigation around uses of you know, things like the Metapixel, uh, session replay technologies, um, things brought under UCL claims and UDAP laws. Uh, it's not stopping. And so really important to um, be understanding what you're doing, how you're doing it, what contracts are in place, ensuring you have appropriate due diligence processes in place and that you understand the litigation risk at hand um, and that you're, what you're doing you know, really brings that business value to justify it. That sounds great. Um, we got about three minutes. We just wanna let you know that we are here to help. Uh, Taylor's information is at the bottom. Ryan and I have our emails there as well. So take a screenshot, find any of us on LinkedIn, reach out in the chat. Um, there is a wealth of uh, experience and knowledge that Taylor has, and uh, I, I trust uh, no one else to talk about uh, managing our ad tech right now. Um, let's see. We had a couple of questions and answers, I understand it. And I think the first uh, question, it came from in the chat about B2B, and we're going to try to do it really quickly. Um, this is from Pamela uh, to Taylor probably. Can you expand more on B2B behavioral advertising? Yeah. So I presume you're just wondering about CCPA, that the CCPA does cover B2B personal information data exchanges in addition to employee data. And those used to be carved out of the CCPA, but 
Um, they are now in scope as of you know January 2023, and so it's important to understand that you know those uh, those data flows are all in scope now. They're not under any of the other laws. It's limited to an individual or household context, but under the CCPA, um, B2B entities who are originally out of scope are in scope now, but none of the other states um, go to that extent. Thanks for that. That's a, an important update. And, you know, Taylor, you said a lot of things today that, you know, I want to take notes on and I'm going to have to replay this webinar. I want to thank Taylor for joining us. Um, I know you have a very busy schedule right now. I really appreciate you coming on here. And Ryan, thank you for coming on and, and sharing uh, your work and your insights with us. Um, on behalf of um, everyone here on the call, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. 